<laughs> so I'm in high school, maybe just after high school, in the living room of my buddy Kyle Orr's house. Um, some of you guys uh, that have known me that long remember this living room. Kyle and his family were cinephiles. If you know what that means, they absolutely loved movies. And so when you walk into Kyle's living room, the very first thing that you notice is he's got these bookshelves that are stretched literally from floor to ceiling and cover two walls that are filled with DVD cases. Um, this was, again, back in high school, so DVD was like the cool cutting-edge technology. And uh, his dad uh, was taking all their old VHSs and then converting them to DVDs and then throwing them up on these shelves. So literally two walls, floor to ceiling, with these DVD cases. They loved watching movies. And so it was about, yeah, I'll admit, uh, 13, 14 years ago. I'm sitting in this living room, and this is where that long ago, over a dozen years ago, the idea for this series actually started to take root. And so we're sitting there. It was in that living room that a lot of things happened. These were, those were formative years, those post-high school years. It was during those times in his living room that the tradition of popcorn chicken and pizza rolls came together. So then if any of us guys were getting together, it was always popcorn chicken and pizza rolls. Those were the entrees that you could look forward to having if we were getting together. And that still happens. I did that earlier this week. A bunch of us got together and we made popcorn chicken and pizza rolls. And so that's where traditions like that would get started. And so we would sit there and we'd eat our popcorn chicken and pizza rolls and then Kyle would introduce us to whatever movie, whatever TV series, whatever was like in his head at that point he wanted to introduce to us. So uh, that was where I first got exposed to so many great things. Uh, first uh, got exposed to the Firefly series in that living room eating popcorn chicken and pizza rolls. My first exposure to uh, Bruce Campbell movies. There's just really campy B horror movies. My first exposure to Bruce Campbell was in that living room. And uh, my first exposure to uh, uh, so many dumb things, uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, if anybody watches Aqua Teen Hunger Force, that was my first exposure there. So they weren't all gold, um, but, uh, but it, was, it was there in that living room that the, that the idea for this series started to, to come uh, into, into formation. And so I wanted to share this with you because so many people have looked at this series and be like, what does that mean? I don't get it. They watch, I, was, I don't get it. Well, we watched a lot of bad kung fu movies at Kyle Orr's house. And I don't remember in particular which specific movie it was. It might have been uh, Shaolin Soccer. Um, it might have been uh, Kung Pao, Enter the Fist. It might have been Kung Fu Hustle. I can't remember. But in one of these movies, we're sitting around eating popcorn, chicken, and pizza rolls and watching a Kung Fu movie. And there's this clip in the movie where one of the guys, they're doing this big fight scene. And the, the guy who was trying to attack the protagonist, his pants end up catching fire. I don't remember how. And then so what happens is the, the man whose pants are then now on fire on his person just starts running. And as he's running, I'm watching, and there's like one of these big like containers uh, like that people would come to like get water from in the middle of the city. It's filled with water. He runs right past it. He doesn't stop, drop, and roll. He doesn't ever remove his pants. He just continues running as fast as he can. And so it struck me, and at that point I was like, dude, no matter how fast you run, you can't outrun your pants no matter what you do because they're, you carry them with you. And so it was a dumb idea that I had at like 18 years old that never quite made it out of the back of my mind. And so fast forward again 12, 13 years, we're sitting in a sermon prep meeting a few months ago, and if you guys uh, have worked with me or are on any teams with me, you know that I absolutely loathe meetings. They're my least favorite thing to do that's a part of ministry, and I understand they're important. I just can't stand them, so I generally have to do things to entertain myself throughout the course of the meeting to make myself laugh, even if no one else. And so we're in this sermon meeting. We're planning out sermon series for the next six months, and this idea creeps up to my head, and it amuses me, so I decide to share it. And so I tell them about this story, uh, about the, the movie that I just shared with you guys, and so and I tell them, I said, but how many people, because I had to try to salvage it, right, so it didn't look like I was just being an idiot. And I said, but how many people do the same thing? They have these things in their lives, these things that have happened in their past, or just what, whatever the case may be, they have these things in their lives that they're trying to run away from. And so they get as busy as they can, and they work as hard as they can, and they try to run away from whatever this thing is that's in their past, but the whole time they're carrying it along with them. And you can't outrun something if you're bringing it along with you. So, so that's, like, that's the idea of the series is we've got to convince people that whatever they're carrying with them, they just got to lay it down or else they can't really get away from it. And I, I accomplished my purposes. I amused myself, got a couple laughs from other people, and I thought that was going to be the end of it. And they were like, no, 
that's not a sermon, that's a series. <laughs> so we ended up with the series, You Can't Outrun Your Pants. And so for all the people who have been watching this and are seeing the video and being like, I have no idea what that means, hopefully that clears it up at least a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be talking about specifically this morning that people are trying to outrun is that I feel like uh, one of the things that we try to outrun but we carry with us is, is this idea of shame. The things that we've done in our past, decisions that we've made. Maybe it's not a distant past. Maybe it's stuff that we're still involved in. But it's, it's this idea of shame that we carry with us and that we just can't seem to whatever it is that weighs on us and brings us down. We just can't seem to leave it behind and move on. It stays with us and it weighs us down in our lives. And so we're going to be looking at this idea of shame and, and, and how to just finally lay that down to not have that burden you uh, so that we can finally move past it. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And so when, when you start to think and you start to go over in yourself, how can we get past our shame? What can you do? The, one of the first things that come to mind are they all sound like Sunday school answers. How many of you guys went to church as a kid? Anybody? Maybe you didn't stay there, but maybe you went as a kid. And, and so depending on what kind of church you went to, you may have had Sunday school. Some of you guys who didn't grow up in the church have no idea what Sunday school is. Uh, but it was basically a Bible study for kids. Um, and uh, it's not exactly what we have for kids. They were more like classroom settings, why they called it Sunday school. And so you had, in Sunday school, you had your standard Sunday school answers. And you had basically four Sunday school answers. And so no matter what the teacher was talking about, if you got called on and you weren't paying attention, you better say one of these four things because the odds are it was the answer to the question they were asking. The answers were God, Jesus, Pray and read your Bible. Those were the four Sunday school answers. And so you could phase out and dream about Power Rangers or whatever I would do while I was in Sunday school class. And then if I just heard Jeff, I'd be like, God. And maybe half the time they're like, exactly, good job. And they thought I was one of the smartest kids in the class. But I just memorized those four Sunday school answers. And so when we talk about, when we get to how can we move past the shame that we have in our lives, so many times I feel like those are the things that come to mind, those Sunday school answers. Well, read the Bible. Well, pray about it. Do this. And I'm not saying those are wrong answers. That's not what I'm saying. But I feel like it's the stuff that we can just call to our heads. And the problem is, uh, in a lot of ways, um, the Sunday school kind of steers us wrong with this particular issue. Uh, because I don't know if you guys remember, again, there were more hands uh, went up than I expected um, for people who grew up uh, in, in the church and so would have that Sunday school experience. But if you remember, uh, back in Sunday school, you got all kinds of stories about these Bible characters. And I feel like, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I would look at some of these Bible characters that they were telling us about, and I would just think, there's no way I can measure up to that. Obviously, I was a kid at the time, but those stories stay with you. And so if I'm somebody who's dealing with shame and I want to go to Scripture, I'm faced with these pictures of these people that I just couldn't help to measure up to, and that doesn't really help with the feelings of shame that I'm already feeling. If I'm already not feeling good about myself and then I look to Scripture and there's somebody that I just can't relate to, somebody that I could never hope to be, um, that doesn't really help in the, the, the issue that I'm facing. So I started thinking about some of these Sunday school characters, these Sunday school stories. And again, those of you who did gr uh, go to church as a child will probably remember these. Um, I thought about uh, the first one, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, if you grew up in the Veggie Tales era, it was Rack, Shack, and Benny, um, which was just much easier to remember. Um, and so we would do Rack, Shack, and Benny. Um, but these were three guys, if you're not familiar, uh, that they talked about. There was this, this, um, this big fiery furnace. And so they were trying to get these three guys, Rack, Shack, and Benny, and they were trying to say, denounce your God, pray to the the, the king instead and recognize him as your God and they absolutely refuse to do it and so they throw them into this fiery furnace because they absolutely refuse to denounce God and then but they don't burn up and so they look in the furnace they're still there and then they come out of the furnace completely unharmed and I'm looking at my life and I'm think in high school, I burned down my girlfriend's kitchen when we were trying to make uh, lumpia one day after, after school. And, um, and I'm like, okay, so check, not Rack, Shack, and Benny. I don't relate to those guys. Uh, that fire was very real and caused quite a bit of damage, unfortunately. Um, so that one's, okay, out of the picture. And so I started thinking, okay, what are some more of these, these Sunday school characters? And so I'm thinking about Daniel, right? Daniel, again, if you're unfamiliar, uh, same deal. Uh, Daniel was caught praying to God when he was illegal, and so they said, all you have to do is just denounce God, and you'll be safe. Otherwise, we're going to throw you in this pit full of hungry lions. 
and, and Daniel again refuses. And so you have this bravery of this, this Daniel who they lower him down into the pit because he refuses to denounce God. And, uh, and he stays there overnight and uh, with these hungry lions all around him. And when they come check on him the next morning, God had spared him and he's completely unharmed. And they lift him out and he's totally fine. And we, so we have the bravery of Daniel. And I'm thinking earlier this week, I no lie, turned off a scary movie because I was watching it in the house by myself and I got creeped out. So, so, I, turned, so I was like, okay, so I'm not Daniel then. Check, not Daniel. And so you look at a guy, so I'm, I'm thinking about some of these other characters and so I think about a guy like David, right? And David was like a big one. Uh, David, uh, one of the earliest things we hear about David, he's a shepherd and so he's watching a sheep and he fights off a lion and a bear with his bare hands. Um, <laughs> bare hands. Um, but so he fights off the lion and the bear and then, and then so we see him come on the scene later and, he's, and he, he defeats the giant Goliath, right? And so he defeats the giant Goliath and he goes on to become one of Israel's greatest kings. He's a warrior, he's a poet, he's a musician, he plays the harp. I don't know how many strings are on a harp, um, but you guys know most of the time I can't get these six strings to sound the way I want them to. I don't know how many strings was on his harp, but he was probably a better musician than I was. And so we've got this picture of David, and I'm like, okay, I don't think I measure up to that guy either. And so uh, David, uh, in addition to all this, was known for being a man after God's own heart. This was thousands of years later. This is David is, is buried. He's underground. We look in the New Testament, and, and the, the uh, Israelites in the New Testament still refer to David as a man after God's own heart. And I'm just like, whew, what do my friends say about me? Like, if, if your friends were describing you to somebody else and you weren't around, what would they say, right? Like, what kind of, you're, again, you're not there. You're not going to hear it. But they say, tell me about this person. What do they say? I had a friend who described me one time, and it was the meanest thing I ever heard in my life. A friend described me, well, he's kind of like the opposite of a party. <laughs> Every, everything great about a party, yeah, just kind of the opposite of that. And it was the meanest thing I ever heard. But like, so you think about that. What, how would your friends describe you when you're not there, when you're not around? And the way that David is described for thousands and thousands of years is he's a man that was after God's own heart. And so already I'm thinking, all right, I think this is another guy I'm not quite going to measure up to. And so David uh, writes the following, and this is uh, the main scripture we're going to be looking at today. Um, my, those Sunday school teachers may have uh, uh, not taught me uh, a lot of things, but the one thing they did teach me that stuck with me is that uh, we're going to be in the book of Psalms today, and they taught me that if you open your Bible right up to the middle, in case you guys are unfamiliar, you're going to hit Psalms, uh, unless you do what I did and hit Proverbs, and you just go to the left like four or five pages. Um, but we're going to be in Psalm 139 today. And uh, we're going to be going through a lot of places, but we're going to keep coming back to this. And so this is one of those, uh, those, those uh, psalms that David wrote. And so we're starting in verse 1. I just want to read verse 1 through 6 together. And so uh, this is, this is uh, David writing this, and he says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. I don't know about you, but for me, that's not necessarily a comforting thought, to know that every single thought that I have, God knows about. Um, it doesn't comfort me much. He says, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. And I just stopped to think, does that mean when I'm in traffic as well? Um, again, not necessarily the most comforting thoughts. Uh, it says, you hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. And then this is how he finishes all that thought. He says, you know everything about me. You know, when I sit and I rise, you know every thought I have. You know every word I say. And he finishes with verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to obtain. And so I think, well, yeah, for a guy like David, played the harp, killed Goliath, was a great king. Yeah, he could probably write those things. Every thought that I have, every word that I have. And so we started to think, yeah, maybe that is wonderful to him. But what about for someone like me? Somebody that has things in my past that I'm not proud of. Things that I've done that I'm, that I, that I'm ashamed of. Things that maybe I'm still struggling with day to day today. That it's like the thought of God knowing every thought and desire that I have is not necessarily something that I would say that's so wonderful for me to think about. And so I look at David and I say, okay, I think David is another one of those people that I can check off. It's just one more character out of this book that I'm never going to live up to that I can never hope to relate to. And so we can kind of check David off of our list. The problem is, these aren't characters in a book. 
These aren't superheroes or, or, or folk tales. They, don't have, they aren't these larger-than-life characters. The people that are described in this book were people just like you and me. And so I think the disservice that Sunday school did for some of us is that they presented this cookie-cutter, clean picture of who somebody was, and they left out so much so that we think that when we look at these characters, that they're, that's not me. I can't relate to that. So it wasn't until years and years and years after Sunday school that I started to get more into the Word and I started to read some of the things that maybe they left out on Sunday morning in fourth grade. And we'll see why uh, for good reason later. Uh, But we start to get to this point uh, where maybe Sunday school uh, did us a little bit of a disservice. Um, There was a lot that they weren't telling us. Um, And so we're going to look more at this character of David. We're going to look more at him, this guy that was a man after God's own heart. Um, I'm going to be jumping around a lot. from uh, the, the, the story of David covers several books in the Bible. It's not a short passage. Um, and so what I'm going to do, all the scripture I'm referring to is not going to be up here on the screen. It's not in your U version. Um, but I am because there's a lot of stuff that you might hear today that would be like, wait, it doesn't say that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the references. So if you want to make notes, you can go back and look at them later. If you use U version, I put all the references in there so you can go back and look at them later. Um, and then if you are somebody who likes to go back and watch the podcast afterwards on YouTube or on our website, I'm going to make sure that they're, they're on there as well so you can go back. I don't want you to take anything that I'm saying uh, without uh, wanting to check it and see what it is. So we're going to take a closer look at the guy who wrote these words that, God, you know everything about me. You know my thoughts. You know every word I say, and I can't fathom how wonderful that is. So we're going to take a little closer look at, at David today. So uh, we're starting in uh, uh, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. And so this is uh, not the first time that we hear of David, but it's when he really starts making waves. And this is, the, this is the story where David fights Goliath, one of the most popular stories in scripture. People that have never even entered a church understand the concept of David and Goliath. This, this is a story that has superseded um, our uh, religion and Christianity and has just become a part of culture at this point. Everybody knows what a David and Goliath story is. And so, but this is the actual David and Goliath story in chapter 17. And so again, if you're familiar with the story, you know that David, who is not a soldier at this point, he's not a warrior, he's just a shepherd boy, and he ends up defeating this mighty giant named Goliath. And so he ends up, through doing this, uh, ingratiates himself with the king. Um, There's no other person in the king's army who is willing to fight him, who is brave enough to fight him. And so David says, okay, I'll do it. And he ends up killing him, and he becomes incredibly wealthy and famous as a result. And so I've heard that story a lot. I heard it plenty of times as a kid. Um, those Sunday school curriculums tend to repeat themselves fairly frequently. And so it's like every 16 weeks or so, you're getting the same stories. So I heard that David and Goliath story plenty of times, but it wasn't until I went back and looked later that we see why. Why did David kill Goliath? And, and in Sunday school, they tell you always because, uh, you know, he was, defi- he was saying terrible things against God and David was offended. And so he stood up for God and he kills Goliath. And that's maybe a part of the truth. But if you actually read through chapter 17, we see David's uh, really his true motives. He is not a soldier. He's a shepherd. His brothers are all in the army. And so he is going back and forth from, uh, from his home and to the front lines of the battle to bring food and to bring news uh, back and forth. Um, So he's there one time visiting his brothers, and so he sees this giant man, Goliath, who every morning goes out and just calls out and says, who you got that can fight me? And, And David doesn't say a thing about it until he overhears a group of people talking, and they're talking about what's going to be done for the person who kills Goliath. And so he overhears this group of men talking, and they say, well, the person who kills Goliath, um, they're going to get to choose any one of the king's daughters that they want as a wife. Um, They're going to be made incredibly wealthy, and their entire family tax-exempt. We'll never have to pay taxes again. And so it's not until David hears these things that he starts saying, okay. And so he goes from one, and he goes to somebody else. He says, okay, okay, I I just heard something. Tell me for real. What happens? What's going to be done for the guy who kills Goliath? And they tell him the same thing. Any of the king's daughters you want, incredibly wealthy, tax-exempt. And then he starts thinking, well, yeah, someone ought to do something about that guy. And so his brothers who were there, and they, start, they hear David asking about this, and they're like, what are you even doing? Go back to the flocks. Who's watching them right now? Why, do, what, why are you so interested in what's going to be done for the guy who kills Goliath? You're nothing but a shepherd. And he says, that's why I'm so interested in what's going to be done for the man who kills Goliath. You think me as a shepherd could get a king's daughter, get welcomed into the royal family, get wealthy, get famous, get status? And so he, his brothers try to put him away and put him off of the idea, but then he just blows them off and he goes to somebody else and said, tell me again, what's going to be done for the man who kills Goliath? 
And so three times in that passage, we see David's maybe truer motivation for why he attacked Goliath to begin with. Money, status, and the opposite sex. And, and, and God not only puts this in Scripture, he says, this is important enough, I want to put it three times. <laughs> and so he puts it in there three times in that one chapter. And so, and for those of you who might be, okay, maybe you're reading a little bit too much into this, we see those same three things follow David throughout his entire life. And they're evident right there at the very beginning. And, and it's okay to have those desires. It's okay to be attracted to the opposite sex. It's okay to want a certain amount of status or enough wealth to take care of your family. Those are not bad things. And when David kept God's lordship above those desires, he was fine. But way too frequently, as we're going to read about, he got them the wrong way around and got himself into a lot of trouble. So we have chapter 17. We've got David and Goliath. Uh, fast forward a bit. We're going to jump to 1 Samuel 25. Uh, we're going to hear about David and this uh, man named Nabal. And so David at this point is on the run. He's got a band of uh, armed soldiers that are his, his men. And uh, he's on the run, and he's camping out in this guy's uh, property, a guy named Nabal. And so Nabal's a very wealthy man, um, and so he has a lot of land, he has a lot of ranchers, he has a lot of livestock. And so David and his men are camping there, and because they're a large troop of very well-trained, very armed men, um, a lot of the bandits and the raiders and the things that you normally see where people would come try to pick off and steal things, they all stay away because David's troop is there. And so David, they're more or less voluntarily protecting this man's land. And so one day David sends word to Nabal and he says, okay, we've been camping here in your, in your, on your property and not the entire time have we been here have we taken a single sheep or anything else to cook for ourselves as food. But since we've been here, we've been kind of protecting everybody. So would you mind for me and my men maybe giving us a few sheep that we can take and we can, and we can barbecue? And, uh, and so Nabal gets this message, and he sends a reply back to David, and he calls David, uh, he insults him. He says, you know, there's a lot of would-be kings running around, uh, but you sound more like a runaway slave, is what he calls David, calls him a runaway slave. And David's ego uh, takes a hit, and so David looks to his men and says, guys, mount up, we're killing everybody. Not Nabal, not Nabal's family. He says, if there is one man left in this entire town by tonight, uh, may God deal with me so severely. He says, every single man is going down. And so they arm up and they go just because somebody took a shot at his ego. And so they come in, and the only thing that keeps him from killing literally everybody is that Nabal's wife, uh, described as a beautiful and intelligent woman uh, named Abigail, finds out what's going on. And so she comes out to meet David before he can get there, and she brings him all kinds of gifts, and she bows down at his feet, and she calls him Lord like four or five times. And that'll probably get a guy's ego back in check a little bit. And so he decides, all right, cool, we're good. And so he decides not to kill everybody. How nice of him. And so uh, uh, not short time after that, uh, Nabal dies of natural causes, uh, sort of. And, um, and so David says, okay, I want that woman. And so he sends his men back and says, he goes and gets Abigail and says, I want her as one of my wives, which he's now beginning to amass kind of a growing number of them. Again, this desire for women stays with David throughout his entire life. So we see uh, how David's ego uh, has affected him. Uh, we're going to fast forward some more. We're going to go uh, to um, 2 Samuel chapter 11. And by this point, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to think myself, okay, maybe I'm a little more like David than I thought. I've done stupid things in the name of women. Uh, I have done, uh, I have not ever set out to kill an entire town, but I have certainly cut down family and friends that I cared about with my words because my ego was on the line. So I'm starting to think, okay, maybe I'm a little more like David than I originally thought. But here we get to uh, 2, Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel, the next book, chapter 11. At this point, David is now king, and this desire that he has for beautiful women suddenly become uh, a, a lot less harmless. And so uh, David is on top of his castle one day, essentially watching pornography from his rooftop. There's a beautiful woman uh, and, uh, who's next door who's bathing on top of her roof, and he's watching. And uh, he's maybe not the first time uh, that he has been up there watching, but for whatever reason, he decides this time that he wants to do more than watch. And so he sends people over and says, I want to know who that is. And so his messengers go over and they inquire. And they say, well, her name is Bathsheba. Her husband is a man named Uriah, who is one of your generals. So this is a man in David's army. 
And so David knows, because it's his army, that the husband's out of town. <laughs> and so he has the men bring Bathsheba over to his palace, and he sleeps with her. Uh, he, again, he gets word a few days later um, that she's pregnant. Um, and he freaks out, does probably what most of us, the first reaction is, okay, how can I cover this up? And so he calls back her husband. He just calls him. He's out at the front lines of battle, and he calls him back, and he sends him in. And so Uriah shows up, and he's like, hey, man, uh, so how are things going out there? And Uriah's like, good. Uh, and he's like, all right, well, I just wanted to give you a couple days off, essentially. Uh, why don't you go home to your wife? And so the thought process is, if Uriah comes in and does what husbands and wives do, then maybe it won't be found out that he had uh, gone behind his back and that he had taken this woman in because uh, the pregnancy could be explained. Well, Uriah turns out to be a pretty decent dude, all things said and done, and he sleeps on his front doorstep. He doesn't even go inside his house. And when David asks why, he says, well, all of the other men are sleeping in tents and they're out at the battle. They'll, they don't get to go home and eat and drink and lay with their wives. Why should I? And so out of respect for the men that he's serving with, he doesn't even go into his house. And so David tries a second time. He gets him drunk the next day and sends him home and once again he refuses to go in and so at this point David says all right I'm in trouble and so he uh he sends he writes a message and that he gives to Uriah and sends him out and I can't help but wondering if the same pen that David used to write half the psalms in scripture wrote to send Uriah on the front lines of where the fighting is fiercest and as soon as you engage everyone else fall back and make sure that Uriah is killed. I wonder if that's the same pen that writes both of those things. And so now, uh, I'm starting to get to a point, I don't know about you, um, but I'm starting to get to a point with, okay, maybe I don't want to relate to David all that much anymore. Uh, maybe measuring up with him is not something uh, that I'm, I'm super stoked about now. But here's the problem. It doesn't end there. If we uh, move ahead, the story continues. We move to chapter 13. And uh, the child that he had had with Bathsheba, the affair with the neighbor next door, um, that child does not survive childbirth. So he uh, he's, uh, then has the, the passing of that child to deal with. Um, and then, but he has other children as well, because again, many, many wives. And so his first son in line to, uh, to inherit the throne is a, is a guy named Amnon. And so Amnon is his first son, should be next in line for the throne. Um, and so Amnon has a crush on his half-sister, a, a girl named Tamar. And it's really more than a crush. He's infatuated with her. And he thinks about her all the time. And, he's, and it says he's physically making himself sick because of how infatuated he is with his half-sister, Tamar. And so he's got a buddy who uh, maybe some of us have had buddies like this in the past, and his buddy says, dude, you just need to get her out of your system. And here's what we do. So they put together a plan. And so they put together a plan, and they say, okay, you're going to fake sick, and when your dad comes in and checks on you and asks what he can do for you, say, well, I want some of that bread that my sister makes. So if you could send her to my room and she could make the bread and I could have it, that would really go a long way towards making me feel better. And so sure enough, David goes, and he gets tomorrow, and he says, hey, your brother's sick. Why don't you go make him some food? And so she gets there, and when she makes him the food and she brings it to him, uh, Amnon sends everybody else out of the room, and he rapes his sister. And so it says, afterwards, he despised her even more than he had loved her previously. And so then after the act is done, after her, she is shamed, he just throws her out. And when David hears about this, Scripture says, David was furious, period, end of sentence. That's it. David was furious, and he does nothing. This is the same guy who just, uh, a book earlier, somebody calls him a name, and he wants to destroy the entire town. And now his son has raped his daughter in his own house, and he does nothing. And I can't help but wonder if it's because when you've knocked up the next-door neighbor, and she's now living in your house, it's hard to sit down on the corner of your son's bed and have a chat about right from wrong. And so I wonder if the shame of what David has brought with him throughout his past is now affecting the way that he can lead his family. The story doesn't stop there. By the end of that chapter, David's second son, uh, a guy named Absalom, um, is so upset at what his brother has done to his sister and the fact that his dad didn't do a thing about it that Absalom takes Amnon out to the field and he kills Amnon. 
And so now we've got uh, the, the baby from the affair has passed away. Uh, we've got son number one is dead. And now we've got daughter number one, Tamar is never heard from again. And so Absalom has lost all respect for David, uh, if you can blame him. And so by cha- uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16, Absalom decides that he's going to run his dad out of uh, town, and he's going to take over the palace himself. And so Absalom sets up that he's going to be king, and same thing, he has a really smart buddy as well that has a plan. And he says, if you want to prove to everybody here that you're more of a man than your dad was, what you got to do is you got to take every one of his wives and you got to take every one of his concubines and you got to take them up to the top of the palace in front of the entire city and you got to sleep with all of them. And that's the way that'll show that you're more of a man than your dad was. And so Absalom does this because apparently you just listen to whatever anybody tells you back then. And so he does this. And so David gets word and David gets uh, obviously upset. And so he rushes back in. He takes the palace back over. And then by chapter 18, Absalom, while fleeing, is killed in the escape. So now David, remember, the man who is known for thousands of years afterwards as a man after God's own heart, now has dead child number one, dead son number one, dead son number two, and daughter that was raped is never heard from again. And uh, there's more to the story, but just for the sake of time, I can't keep going. You move into 1 Kings, and you've got two more of David's sons um, that are fighting over who's supposed to have the throne. They're from different moms because, again, that was David's way. And so one of them kills the other, and so there ends up being more bloodshed uh, in the family. And so I can't help but wondering how a guy who has lived the life that David has lived can sit down and pen the lines, God, you know every single thing about me. You know everything that I've ever done, every thought that I've ever had, every word that I've ever said. You know when I sit up, when I lie down, you know who I've lined down with. And he says, the fact that you know all of these things is wonderful to me. And so there's this disconnect for me. How can a guy who has lived the life that David has lived think that this is a wonderful concept? Uh, Well, we're going to go back to Psalm 139 and see if we can get some more uh, light shed on this. So we're going to go back to Psalm 139. Uh, We ended in verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to obtain. So we're going to pick up in verse 7. And so in verse 7, we're reading, and uh, and it says, uh, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. And so these verses, 7 through 12, David is basically writing, there is literally nothing that we can do that can separate us from the love that God has for us. God will always be with us. It doesn't matter if I go up, if I go down, if I go east, if I go west, if I go in the darkest place I can find, it's like light to you. There's literally nothing we can do that can separate us uh, from God. Wherever we go, he's with us. And so we sit there and we think, okay, but what about the time when I no, Yes, he is with you. What you don't know about the time that I, yes, he is with you. But what about when I, no, yes, he is with you. And so this doesn't make sense to us. We get it. I understand it. I understand what David is saying, but I still can't, it doesn't add up in my head. Especially with a guy who's lived the life that David has. How can he sit there then and write, okay, but I know that whatever I do in my life, God is with me. So then the question really becomes, why? There are very few people uh, on this planet um, that I think could hold their life up next to David's and, 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 and have a similar story uh, with the amount of things that they uh, had done in their lives. But he's able to sit there and write these words confident, uh, confidently that no matter what he does, he knows that God is with him and he wants to have that same relationship with you. But why? And if we read the next couple verses, starting in verse 13, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. 
So why is it that whatever we go through in our lives, whatever shame we have, whatever bad decisions, whatever things that we've done that have hurt people, that have hurt our families, that have caused a terrible situation for ourselves, that we can sit back and look and say, but I know that God is with me. And the reason is because you are his. I'm not a parent, uh, so I can't speak from experience. But God has that love for us that a parent has, that you can sit there and you can watch your child stumble. You can watch your child make terrible mistakes. You can watch your child screw up their entire life. And it's, it hurts you, but you know that no matter what they get into and no matter how many times they make the same mistakes, that when it comes down to it, that you are there for them. It's that, that, that love that a parent has for their child. And so, uh, and, and so we've got, uh, again, uh, reading 13 and 14, it says, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And then I love this part. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know that full well. So we are God's child. We are God's workmanship. It says that he has created us. He had put us together. We are God's works. And then it says that your works are wonderful. So how many math nerds do we have in here? Do we have any math nerds in here? Couple? All right, all right. There's something, there's a theorem in, in algebra called the transitive property of equality. Who can tell me what the transitive property of equality is? Ah, oh, so maybe we don't have as many math nerds as I thought. Calling you out, no. Um, transitive property of equality says this, and it's so simple, you're going to be like, they came up with a name for that? That doesn't make sense. The transitive property of equality says that if A equals B, and if B equals C, then... A equals C, right? They named that. That's not just called the common sense theory of equality. It's the, it's the transitive property of equality. And so if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And so we have this kind of, this almost transitive property uh, thing going on here. It says, well, I'm God's workmanship. He created me and knit me together. I am uh, one of his works and his works are wonderful. So if we say if God's works are wonderful and I am one of God's works, then what? I am wonderful. That's just math. <laughs> and so we have this idea that God has this love for us because we are his. We are his child. We are his workmanship. I love the way uh, that Ephesians puts it. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, um, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance for us to do. So in Ephesians 2.10, it says, We are God's handiwork. And we don't generally get too deep into the Greek uh, always that's used, but I wanted to today because that word, that handiwork word in Greek is poema. And so what English word do we get from poema? Poem. So he's saying we are God's poem, a living, breathing work of art that God has created. And so we can look at these things that we've done in our lives and, and, and they, they, they create scars and they create a, a, almost a tangible weight that we can carry along with us that keep us from truly living into that relationship that we have with God because we just look at all these things that we have in our lives and we say it distorts the image of how God sees us. And God says, I view you as a child. I view you as my workmanship. I view you as my poem." And we say, but no, God, you don't, what about this? What have I done this? I've done this. You don't know, like you may, have, you may have created me to be one thing, but I've done something else. And God says, no, you are my child. You are my workmanship. You are my poem. And so um, it's not quite the end of where we're going to go today uh, because as you guys have noticed, Mike is not here today. If he comes back, well, he will come back, not if. He will be back next week. And when he comes back next week, um, when he talks to you guys and say, well, what did Jeff talk about? Well, Jeff told us we're all wonderful. Um, and that's it. He's not going to let me preach anymore. Um, so that's not entirely the end of where we're going to go, but that's just so important to me that I want to make sure that we get that, that God creates, his works are wonderful. God has created us, and so we were created to be wonderful. So where's the disconnect, though? If I say that's not the end, if I say, okay, well, that can't be the end of what we talk about, um, where, what, what's the part that we're missing out? God has said that we're his child, we're his handiwork, we're his poem, and that makes us wonderful, but it can, it's also true that we can take what God created to be wonderful, and we can do some really ugly things with it, can't we? 
And so we take what God has created to be wonderful, and yeah, we may have made some really dumb decisions, and we may have done some terrible things, made a lot of mistakes. Again, maybe some of it is in our past, maybe some of it we're still struggling with, and so it's so easy for us to get caught up in those things and say, well, you know what? I don't see myself the way that God sees me. I don't see myself as wonderful. I don't see myself as a work of art. I don't see myself as his child or as his, his craftsmanship. And so what is the one thing uh, that when we take something that he uh, has created to be wonderful and do something really ugly with it, um, like David did, we have all these scars that we carry along with us. And um, the one thing uh, that makes it possible for us to walk through the lives that we've walked and to get to a point where we're viewed as God's prized possession, God's work of art, is simply one thing, and it's the cross. The cross is that eternal reminder that whatever we've walked through in our lives, whatever we've, we've done, whatever we've uh, maybe inflicted upon other people, whatever shame we walk through us, that the cross is the, is the reminder that we don't have, those things don't have to define us. And so it's obviously if we were perfect people coming to God, the cross wouldn't be necessary. The cross reminds us that all people who come to God are broken. All people who come to God have pain, have things in their lives that they're dealing with, and that the cross makes it to where that, those things no longer have to define us. Because that's really what it is, is that because of the cross, you can have these things in your past, you can have these things that you've walked through, but they no longer define who you are. It's something that you may have done, but it is not who you are. And so no longer are you the, uh, the things that you've done in your past. You're not the money maybe you took from work because you thought no one was looking. You're not the poor decision that you made that hurt your family. You're not uh, the jealousy that you have when you look at other people and it makes you so bitter. You're not the resentment that you carry with you because somebody hurt you in the past and you can't quite let it go. You're not the pornography that you watch when you're home and no one else is around. You're not the affair that you had that one weekend when you're out of town. You're not the addiction that you had in your past or maybe the addiction that you still struggle with. And so what the cross does is it takes these as things that you may have done and says, but they are not who you are. The cross makes it possible that we can come before God and still be seen as wonderful, as his workmanship, as his uh, child, and as his poem. And so that's really what I want to drill down into today. If there's one thing that you would take away from this is that we don't have to be defined by those things uh, in our past. And so the, probably the most famous single verse in all of scripture that a lot of you in here could probably recite without us even having to put it on the screen uh, really drives this point home. And so uh, we have John 3.16. Uh, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so it was out of his great love for you that Jesus chose the cross, so that you could erase all those things that have been done in your past and that you can have that relationship with God, that you can come before him as a child to his father or as creation to created and that we don't, and you don't have to be defined by those things that you've done. And so this was his love for you is what, is what made that possible and what makes the cross uh, so important. We're no longer the sum of the things that we've done. And so all we have to do now with those things in our life is choose to let them go. That's what we've been doing here. It's what we've been talking about with this series, the can't outrun your pants. You can't outrun your pants because you carry them with you. And so you've come to a point now where God says, this is how I view you. And so if you're somebody who's sitting here, okay, but this is how I view myself, and you're somebody who is a follower of Christ, you don't need to view yourself that way anymore. All the things that you hold up in your life that you think come between you and God or that affect the way that God may view you, all you have to do is put them down and leave them and walk away. It doesn't matter what it is. And so that's what this series is all about. And so uh, it's impossible to outrun the things in life if we carry them with us. And so the only way to truly get past them is to leave them behind. And so uh, I'm going to ask the band to come back up uh, as, as we're wrapping up. And so my desire for all of you guys that are here this morning is 
is that that could be something that for you becomes a reality, not just something that you come in here and that you hear somebody talk about and that it goes into your head and maybe you took some notes and then you walk away, but your life remains unchanged. This is something that if you're struggling with shame, if you have things in your past that you just can't seem to put down and get rid of, this is something that should be incredibly life-changing. And so my desire is for everybody in here that they can really grasp the freedom of what it means to be a follower of Christ. It's what, uh, oh, it's not there, huh. Still in my past. Um, but we talk about our rhythms. And that's what uh, that healing in rhythm is about. Is that when we choose to come before Christ, we come from a lot of different places. And we come with a lot of hurt. And we can come with a lot of shame. And we can come with a lot of bad decisions in our past. But when we choose to follow Christ, if we allow him to do it, there is a healing and a freedom that becomes a part of our lives as we take one by one those things that we have that keep us uh, from being the people that God wants us to be and we just lay them down at the foot of the cross and we say, okay, we're leaving them here because the price that Jesus paid in his crucifixion and resurrection overshadows all of the things that we have done in our past, all the things that we will do in our future and makes it so that no matter where we go, high, low, east, west, darkness, nothing can separate us from God and his love and he will be there with us always. So, I'm going to pray, um, and I would like for you guys to pray with me. This might be a little, uh, a little Sunday school, um, again, if you, if you have that background. Uh, but I want you guys to, to close your eyes, and we're going to pray together. Um, and uh, there there's may be some of you guys out there, uh, as we're praying and as I've been talking about this, that say, okay, I've never really experienced that freedom uh, that comes with being a follower of God. I've never really experienced, uh, I've never made that decision to come before God and say, okay, all these things that I've done in my life, I just want to lay them down with you, and I want to walk on uh, as a new creation. And so there are some people out there that maybe have not made that decision, and maybe that's uh, something that you're looking at today, and, and that's something maybe that you're just starting to, uh, to maybe just mull over and struggle with in your head. And so as, as uh, I just want to pray for you guys that that would be my desire for you, that God would just draw you unto him that God would show you the grace that he has and the freedom and the healing that he wants to bring in your life, that all you have to do is make that decision and say, I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to take the past that I have and the things that I've done in my life and I want to lay them down for good and I want to just follow after you and try to live the life that you have called me to. And so there are some uh, of you in this room that might be experiencing that this morning and there's going to be others in this room that maybe you are a Christ follower. Maybe you've been following Christ for decades but there's still things in your life that you can point to and you know uh, and you may not have shared them with anybody but there's something that you know that you just cannot get past. And so my prayer is for you this morning that you would just be able to lay those down for good that you can say, okay, I know that this is something I have in my past, but I know that this is not what God, see, God sees when he looks at me. That this is not who I am. This is something that I did. And that if I'm a follower of Christ, that I know that I have been forgiven for that. And I know that I no longer have to carry it with me. And I no longer have to feel the weight and the burden and the things that affect my relationships with other people. The things that make it to where I can't open up and have uh, fully intimacy with, with my spouse or with my friends or with my family. The effects that these carrying these things with us throughout our lives that we just want to say, you know what, today it's gone. Today, I'm going to leave it here, and when I walk out of this room, I'm going to be a different person. And so again, this may seem cheesy, but if that's you, if you're somebody, and I'm not going to tell you to raise your hand or anything else, but if that's you, if that's somebody that you can point, if somebody says, what's the one thing in your life that you have shame about that you can't seem to get rid of? Again, maybe it's a, it's a decision you made in the past. Maybe it's something with your family. Maybe it's something sexual. Maybe it's an addiction. Whatever it is that's in your life that you cannot seem to get past, I want you to just visualize it in your head right now. I want you to take whatever that decision, whatever that situation, whatever it was, and I want you to visualize it in your head, and I want you to visualize a cross. And I want you to just visualize taking that and just letting it go. Putting it on the ground there so that when you walk out of this room, you're going to experience a freedom that you haven't felt in years because you know that, yes, that may have been something I did, but no, that is not who I am. And that is not the way that God sees me. And I'm going to spend the rest of my time trying to see myself the way God sees me because that's the person I want to be. I want to be who he has envisioned and who he has called me to. 
And so that's my prayer for, for you guys this morning. And so God, uh, we just pray that you be with everybody that's here. Uh, we thank you so much for being a God uh, that, uh, that takes a personal interest in our lives, a God that loves us, a God that cares for us, and a God that has provided a way through the cross and through uh, Jesus Christ that the things that we've done in our lives no longer have to separate us from you, but that we can come before you as a child, as your creation, as your poem, and have that relationship with you this morning. So we thank you for that, and I pray that that's just something that is just made so real in the hearts of people this morning. In your son's name, amen.